This is round two. We have more calculus, more John, more Mississippi. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Travis. I was worried when you said you were going to say something, but I'm a little worried to worse than that. More Mississippi. Yes, I am John Travis. I am, am a relatively newbie, I guess, to Sage. Uh, one thing I would recommend you do, if you like me, is I like to wander around the room, and I really like low tech. Uh, calculus, so I'm the kind of guy that walks around the room like this all the time in Cal 3, or Cal 4 for you, <laughs> and I'll get students and they'll become a plane here, another student becomes another plane, we watch them intersect. So, <laughs> uh, you, watch, you have to watch gender issues, of course, um, certainly, especially from my perspective, I can do them, but not me. But uh, I like to use uh, SAGE really as a demonstration tool. I, I've only been, a, a, again, a newcomer. I was part of the uh, MAA workshop last summer. That was my first exposure to SAGE. So what you're going to see today is really what, you, what, what a newbie would be doing. Um, and my focus is really on visualization, interacts, and I have, I've started working on developing uh, projects for students to do, but that's still not you know, come, come to fruition yet. I am a, I'm the chair of my department, so uh, the, the chair evaluation for this is pretty good. <laughs> but then I've got a dean who's a biology guy who just doesn't give a rip. My, my annual evaluation this year was two lines. The first line, the second line was his boilerplate, everybody gets this, we appreciate your service to Mississippi College. And the first one was, uh, appreciate your service to the MAA. And that was, that was my entire evaluation. And, and I, all this stuff that I've been trying to do, and that was it. So, um, uh, so I, it doesn't matter, I'm tenured and then, um, and full professor, so it doesn't matter. But still, you'd like for them to say, here's an extra 2% or something. Um, but nonetheless, there it is. Uh, everything I have here is located. I've set up a server. Um, I had some money left over at the end of the year. Uh, not a lot, but uh, it's like, hey, I'm the chair. I'm going to buy a server. So I found a you know, double, double quad processor machine, set it up. And uh, thanks. Did, did you write the script for setting up the uh, server? Uh, yeah, Dan did the original one, and then I did another one. I don't know which one you it, followed, but it, it, well, nonetheless, worked beautifully. Yeah. And so uh, I went in the first part of my calculus. This is calculus four for us, by the way. In the first part of my calculus four class, I went from using a, a server we had set up on our university cluster in our system of minute uh, where every time you have more than six people on it, it just hangs up. Because of, because of the resources they allocated to me. Now we could run a class of size 18 to 19 at the same time. So I was wildly happy with that. Um, uh, get a Bluetooth mouse. I'm the kind of guy who likes to wander around the room or maybe even hand the mouse to uh, one of the students. I also have a Bluetooth keyboard, not really well on the airplane. Um, but I'll take the keyboard and some hand it to a kid and say, you do it. And uh, within 10 meters, which is about anywhere you want to go, it works pretty good. So if you want to look at these things, please don't crash my server. Um, uh, there's a wiki there as well. I have them. Um, just for the heck of it. There it is. I even left the it works up there and just didn't, uh, you know, who cares. But um, uh, a lot of these things are located there, and so you're welcome to, uh, to go there and find them if you want to. Um, again, my history is I was introduced to Sage. Oh, Bob, I'm doing the Carl Dieter approach to presentations today. Um, everything is in this worksheet here. So, uh, if I have to evaluate something, it's going to go to the next cell and things are going to pop around. So, I agree with you. Yeah, but, Williams JavaScript. Uh, <laughs> yes. So, um, I was um, introduced last year. So, again, everything that I've learned has been since summer of last summer. Uh, the calculus course that I taught, uh, this stuff that I'm doing today in, was this past spring. So, this is all just very new. I've been trying to refine a lot of it here to make it where it looks a little better and where I, you forget to document things after a while. Um, and so if, if somebody were to use it, you'd like to, if they want to steal it, that's fine, please take it. Um, I did actually do a uh, introduction to stage workshop this spring at the Louisiana Mississippi section of the MAA. We had a, a room full of folks, including uh, Michael and John. Didn't realize I was doing it. He jumped in. It was a great resource. We tried to get on stage NB. Uh, uh, the, the main one is like, oh my goodness. And so then I, we farmed them out to mine and farmed them out to his. And we had everybody farmed out, but eventually we got on. Um, I've been using open source and freeware stuff uh, ad hoc for years, and um, I'm really delighted with the way this, the notebook is so portable. Uh, especially the students I have at Mississippi College are uh, not necessarily computer uh, savvy, uh, but they can do this. And so if I'm trying to get them involved with something interactive, something investigated, 
Um, yeah, no, this is the way to do it. I've been trying to develop worksheets. Uh, at my university, we're teaching university. And so my, uh, this past spring, I taught five classes and chaired the department. One of the classes was a seminar. But so this is, I'm busy. Um, but I've been trying to develop uh, worksheets uh, in several different areas here. I did not use SAGE for my real analysis course this past spring. So, uh, can we use it for measure theory? OK. I, I, that's, I didn't say that. It's a bit of patch. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of patch. A big patch, yes. But what I'm going to try to do today is show you um, just some, some interacts that I've been using that I, I hope are helpful in helping some see uh, three-dimensional concepts. And you may like them, you may not. I have passed out some glasses as we go along the way. I may have one that we may switch to the three-dimensional, uh, the stereo being on or off. Um, but for a multivariate course, typical things you cover is a vector calculus, a vector functions, parcel D, uh, multiple integration, and, vector, and then uh, vector fields and such. In my institution, uh, I did not, uh, the uh, uh, vector functions is in Cal 3. And so, um, I don't have any spreadsheets for that, or worksheets for that, although I did steal one that I'll try to show you. Uh, we actually meet in the computer lab, so one thing I was trying this week, uh, this, uh, this, this uh, past spring, was using presentations a lot. I tried to do a few homework assignments and a few group assignments, and uh, uh, I did uh, use SAGE itself as a way of uh, being here when I'm gone. Uh, we had the uh, section meeting up in uh, uh, Oxford this year. So, this being very, 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 uh, I guess start at the beginning here, one thing I would do in this class is uh, certainly assign a preliminary worksheet. For you guys in the uh, MA workshop, I guess y'all have seen these preliminary worksheets. Did y'all create one this time? How do you use SAGE? All the little widgets. Yeah, that's the kind of thing I would do. But basically, how do you use SAGE? But um, my students are very limited in their programming. The hurdles, of course, you all know this, that students or having to do with multivariate calculus is they've forgotten all calculus they've ever had in every other course. <laughs> and so I, I'm trying to use SAGE as a supplement for some of the forgotten material. So they don't have to worry about <coughs> partial fractions or integration of <coughs> parts details. But you can't use SAGE, I don't think, as a proxy for their ignorance. You must use it as a way of, I think, of, um, of encouraging them to go back to those materials and, and discover them. Maybe uh, do it um, in such a way that they don't have to worry about the answers right or wrong. I did, on top of everything else, I did give them a couple extra study sessions extra weeks. So I, yes, yes? So what's the difference between those two points? Like, can you give an example of what's, uh, what's okay to forget and use SAGE to use and what's not okay and, and is classified as what you're calling the ignorance? Well, for example, they've forgotten, let's say partial fractions. They've forgotten partial fractions. They should, certainly should know how to take the rational function and what I should expect, I think. But then you set up the system of equations, and it becomes difficult to have some irreducible quadratics. I don't really care about whether they can solve those by hand anymore. That's just that's just my take on things. I, I, I view Sage as, as, as the savior for those kind of situations because that's something. Oh yeah, we can do that, and we can set these up, and if they're all linear, then yeah, we can solve them. Um, but it, you know, it's just I don't want to waste time on that. I would have the special study sessions here, and this is again not Sage. This is just regular teaching. Um, and I would go through and just pop anything on them from Cal 1 through Cal the current class. And um, it seemed to help. But the, uh, I'd come back to SAGE and say, now here's how you do it to SAGE to save yourself the time. So students need to be able to see 3D objects, and I think they need to be able to understand them conceptually. So just a reminder for you guys, either, if anybody's brand new here, is uh, the functions there for plotting in three dimensions. There are, of course, others. And a reminder that there are a zillion um, uh, options. And uh, Carl Leder, I saw one of the tickets that said this needs to. This is a good ticket for Spur newbie to do, which is uh, to go through and help with adding some more documentation, maybe better examples or something. So I'm going to try that one. So I found one that maybe I can add one little little something here to get kind of started, so I don't break the wheel. Um, but nonetheless, uh, just a reminder of that. So let's go see what we have here. Okay, that goes on for a while. Okay. So um, the first thing I would do if I was starting out um, and trying to figure out what to do is maybe steal a sheet. So sometimes when you're trying to like, learn HTML um, or trying to learn anything, 
uh, I guess, web work. I've stolen a bunch of web work problems and done them very poorly, but that's at least the place where I start. And um, I would encourage you to go to the Sage Wiki. We're not going to, well, I guess I can, we can shell out there for just a second. Um, oh, there's a zillion tabs. I'm not going to bother. Um, but there are, I'll do it this way. There are a number of things already done, uh, but the list is not terribly long. And this is a place that I'm, I would like to try to contribute some stuff back to. That's what I'm trying to work on a lot this week, is fill in some of these gaps or maybe add something to these lists. Um, so, but when you're trying to start out, don't forget the Sage Wiki. Don't try to, try to reinvent the wheel, if at least there are some wheels that are already running. So uh, consider that. Uh, the following sheet, this is, it's your standard issue question if you've got a vector, uh, vector value function. Look at a bunch of things. And so I'll go ahead and go to this uh, sheet, which, by the way, I'm running all of this off of a uh, served version. So um, let's just kill this. Let's go. There we go. So my. Um, my Linux side of this thing um, isn't working properly with the uh, plugin for uh, 3D stuff, so I've, I'm running this off our server at Mississippi College now, so please don't get on it and kill it or something. But here's one. Thank you, uh, Rob and Jason. And I just cut and pasted this from the Sage Wiki. And I go down here and I evaluate it after all is said and done. Boom. And did that go beyond it or did that go in front of it? That's it. Ah, no way. This is your problem, Carl. I didn't create No, no, no. This is your problem with the uh, going to the next sale. And this is what I get when I paste the thing from the uh, wiki site verbatim. And there's a mistake in it. So you, you can start with those there, but sometimes they don't work. And what happened is up here, apparently, I don't know if this is an old thing or maybe a, a ticket issue, is when you are trying to compute some derivatives right here. Um, do you see derivatives yet? Uh, I'll find them eventually. Yeah, that's, that's awful looking. Oh, there we go. There's no argument there. There's no, there's no independent variable there. And that does work if you're at the command line and just typing things in. But apparently inside this, it doesn't work. And so I go through and go, oh, I see what the problem is, because I look at the error message down here, and it tells me something. And so I go back and add the little T's in there. And lo and behold, it now works. And so these are the type, types of things you can just grab for free off the wiki. First place to start. No, oh, this is uh, one of those things where x equals x of t or whatever. I don't yeah, that needs to be fixed. It's not a big deal. I don't have this one set up for 3D, but you can you know, play with this all, all you want. So, so the, the fun part of this is that I would write these things in the afternoon and post them, and then overnight Jason would soup them up. <laughs> <laughs> I would pick them up a half hour before class from Jason's improvements and take them into class. And we did that all semester. Back and forth that's, eventually. That's, that, that's the year I didn't sleep. <laughs> So I need to find somebody here, Jason. No, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I gotta go find the original one now. So John, a nice uh, outcome of your idea to kind of you know track some of these resources a little bit better mm -hmm. would be that if these things can be placed into a file or interacts library, whatever, or even just like some random file somewhere else, then you could doc test this, mm -hmm. right? And it could automatically be checked, you know, that 500,000 examples all work, you know, with Sage 4.7. And if they don't, then we you know what the fix. As opposed to leaving something on the wiki for somebody less technically inclined than you to find those T's. Well, I, I intend to go through the wiki and help you with that just, by, just manually. Um, that's what I intend to do. It's just time. Yeah. Right. And, and you guys you guys are machines. I mean, it's 10 o'clock at night. It's 1, you know, it's 1 in the morning my time. I don't think you do it. Um, but um, regardless, there we go. All right, so start trying to add something of my own. And so the next thing we would do in my class is moving on to uh, visual, visualization of functions. Uh, I would really like to have slices here. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, I or I could fix x naught or y naught and let the, let the other two variables vary. And that would be wonderful. 
Um, but we can fix slices with respect to z, and those are, of course, contour plots. And so the standard issue question for students is, fix the z, what do you see? And so I can click there, but I'll go back over here. So we could, you, you could rotate the 3D yes, slot. Once you have a graphics, it's very easy to rotate the entire graphics. So yes. It's a workaround, but this will be much better with John. And so here's one thing that I would do, and um, I've left this open, I guess, is I've tried to make some interacts here where the students can enter whatever they want to here for the function, and they can play with the z value. One thing I've done a little differently here, instead of doing the standard, whoops, instead of the, I just killed the picture, didn't I? Yeah. Okay. Instead of uh, doing the standard contour plot, we list a bunch of contours, I list two, above and below. And uh, one day, one way I do that is making the bottom very, very small. Uh, you can add that in uh, the right here. And so I add uh, two contours, essentially, one at negative 1,000, which is generally out of the way for most people. Um, I guess I can make it even smaller. But here's what I'll do with this. Is this past spring, I had the students go through, and um, let me get this first. Let's see. Let me click right there. Okay. And I'll have them print these out, all the same size. Have them then take the, this and cut and put it on a piece of thick paper and cut out all the black parts. Now this one's kind of a little bit too, uh, too uh, rich, I guess, in black and white parts. But actually construct a 3D solid. If you go through and take these things and cut out the black parts and keep just the whites, put them in one place, and then take the next contour and do it again. Let me pull it out here where it's a little less busy. Let's make this smaller too. I mean, with just pieces of paper, or with something thick, thicker thick, like thick styrofoam? Card card the, the answer is yes. Paper. Oh, okay. Some some people came in. It's, it's not re auto update. Is all. This is the something that went home and did. Yes, this was a group project. Okay. And uh, they literally came in with. Is it updating yet? You may have to reevaluate. Sometimes it times out. Yeah, I, I was trying to do that so since I'm on the CERB version, I want it to look like it was right on the machine here. All right. There we go. There, there we go. And so, that's, oh, that's too hot. Right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> enough? Not enough. Let's try there. Okay. Uh, there, yeah. And so I, they could they could paste this on a piece of paper and cut out with a thick paper, like cardboard paper, then like cardboard or, or construction paper, and literally could create tiers, and then more tiers and stack them on top of each other. And the cool thing is if you took the holes that you cut out and were going to throw away and kept them in reverse order, stacked them up from the bottom, then you can have the bottom and the top. And if you didn't mind it, you could actually glue them together, except for the thickness in the middle. You could see the surface from the top and see it from the bottom if you wanted to. Of course, some kids came in with regular cardboard. You know, each, each tier was like this. So one kid came in with stacks, I had, I had like maybe 40. And it came with a stack of things this high, but it was about this wide, so it was impossible. Uh, but some of them came, came with really nice ones. And I, I required them each to have at least one peak and one valley. So that was, that was the requirement. And it couldn't go weird, weird off to the edges. So they had to think about a function that didn't blow up on the edges, that had a peak and had a valley. That was it. Okay. They have to come up with these functions? Well, yeah, I'd help them a bit. What, what, what they had to do is come with a function and come see me. Because I didn't want them all doing the same function. So somebody come by and say, you got that one. You know, and they all want sine at x plus y or something. You know, okay, we can't all have that one, but the first group can. You know, and so but they got to still figure out the nice, the nice range of This one's too bit too much, because there's too many little snips that you have, would have. I mean, technically, technically you could do it, right? You couldn't. But this is real simple. As long as the screen is the same size, and they can even, I even talk about it, you have to capture it. A, uh, a screenshot and paste them all in like a Word document or something and just print the whole document off at once and you're set to go. Um, while I was at it, I did also put these in down here um, so they could actually see what, what part of the thing they're looking at. So that's kind of... I guess uh, since I gave you the glasses, I'll just remind you of this. When looking at these 3D objects, any of them, uh, oh look at the glasses come out. There's a, there's a selection right here. Uh, let's see, where is it now? Let's see, style, stereographic, pick the right color. You have to pick the right color. All the red and blue still kind of work. Yeah. But um, there you go. I almost always leave spin on 
because I don't want to fiddle with it. Is it working? As Rob's noticing the uh, picture opportunity here. <laughs> That's a little complicated for it to be real dramatic. But it yeah, I guess I could also zoom in. Yeah, post this on Facebook, Rob. <laughs> and, and I did get the message. The new interface will have a little pop-up that allows you to select the stereographic just what glasses display, although that's, no, I haven't done there's that more. one yet. There's more, yeah. Okay, so take your 3D glasses off. <laughs> okay, so let's go back here. So the next thing, after you go through, learn how to visualize the surface, then you want to start dealing with the calculus of things. So you do limits. Uh, limits are always problematic because you can do none of them. You can show where they don't exist, but you can very seldom show that they do. And so you end up doing the polar coordinate trick. And so you're doing a standard issue question here. And so let's just go ahead and look at 3D limits. Uh, again, all of these are on my wiki. One thing I do a little differently here because I was trying to do a couple things in one sheet, although I eventually will make those two interacts, is I didn't want to enter the function twice. So this is where I first introduced my non-computer literate fun uh, students to actually a text cell, a cell. And so they have to go through, and I've got, I guess, three functions here for them to choose from in this example. One that has a nice limit at some point, at zero, zero, another that doesn't have a nice limit, and then another one would have to go somewhere else. Then they can start playing with all the examples they have in their homework and testing them first. Uh, of course, the answers that you might turn in aren't going to be yes or no. The answers are going to be, well, if there's no, then why? You could pick me some paths and show me they're different. And so this can actually help them out with that. So, one thing I would really like to have in, in uh, uh, JMAL is uh, time-dependent graphs where I can essentially let R be a time mm -hmm. and animate this right ice cream going to come down a bit. So I'll start out letting them input whatever surface they want to up here. They get to pick uh, the point they want to approach, and we simply can let the radius um, surrounding that point go to zero. Is it done yet? No, I didn't do it yet. It's timed out, so let's just do it again. The whole thing of Gavin sent ahead of time was it wouldn't time out. But, but, all right, so the top of the screen here. Oh yeah. Hi. Nice. You. Pretty. Yeah. And let's just cut to the chase here. I don't let it go to zero, of course. Um, but you can look at this problem here. And that may be, yeah, can y'all see it? Let me make it a little bit bigger. You can see that it doesn't approach a point. And it's all automatic. You just enter the function, and then you can manually let, let R go to zero. This should show you that it does work. Well, let me show you one of the things since I've got that function in. Down here, I don't know if I stole this from somebody or not, but I can do the same type of thing here and do more and more contours. And what should happen, there was that same little issue. I don't know why there's another one of those that just appeared. Ooh. Oh, it, it timed out. Yeah, same reason. This is just another little trick, and this doesn't involve 3D glasses. The guy didn't turn the 3D glasses on yet for uh, this stuff. And so you can see at this point here, all different levels are coming into it. So it's another way to help the students understand what's going on. Um, let's just go ahead and show you real quick. Uh, what happens if it does work. There's another bug juice where the high and auto only works. Sometimes, sometimes they work together, sometimes they don't. I do. Okay. It's already there. Okay. Oh, this is it. Okay. So we'll pull this one down real small. Again, I don't have 3D turned on on this one. I'm so sorry. I should have a little button. But you can see for this one, as you go through, the thing collapses down to, a, to essentially a point. And so you can say, there's a limit on this one. And it's, there it is. Well, you saw it. And down here, uh, doing this one again. So I guess I have to reevaluate it. Is it? It's here, right? Yeah. Yep. And so as the number of contours grows, you'll see that I'm still right there, very small jumps away. So that means there is a limit. So lots of different ways of looking at something very basic as a limit. 
in calculus for. Of course, they get really pretty when you get really big. John, I, did you have to do anything special to the color bar uh, to get it to have the, because usually the color bars are kind of continuous. Yeah, I'll do fill equals false. Fill equals false to make the color bar also. I'm trying to remember. Um, yeah, the fill equals false automatically changes the color bar too. That's what I was thinking. Alright, good. So, that answers that one. Nice, sir. Yes, Alright, so we move on. Uh, partial derivatives is, is going to be terribly uninteresting to you right now. There's a sheet to make there about partial derivatives. I just haven't done it. Um, so, that's, that's, there's stuff you can get. Um, the gradient and more partial derivatives. Again, there's no one on the Sage Wiki. And uh, this is another attempt to. Um, Want to extrema, so trying to go through and find maxes and mins of things. Um, let's just click here and do it in fashion way. This is another one where um, I'm trying to, to uh, find critical values and such. It's just very difficult to solve some of these problems, uh, some of the equations. So I have a, 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 a very simple worksheet set up that I, I would the students use for homework, but I would also use this in class just to show how it works, um, where they could choose a function and the gradient just pops out, all the partial derivatives pop out, the uh, solutions, uh, critical points pop out, including all the Ds. Now, this kind of thing could be made into a really nice interact, perhaps, where it could all automatically say, here's a max, here's a min, and such. This needs to be packaged together and such. And you have a nice little picture here where you can actually see the maxes and mins on the surface. So um, this one still needs a bit of work, so uh, on that. And one little point I wanted to, this was on the, uh, the Sage developed Google group a little while, uh, I guess this past couple weeks, is you have to be careful with solving. And um, solving something like this should be real easy, right? Well, Sage can do that one. Uh, something like this should also be real easy. And Sage can do that one, but something surprising shows up because it starts getting complex solutions all of a sudden but no complex, complex solutions for this one. And for this one here, uh, where the answer should be also relatively easy, um, it can't find anything. And so um, this is just something you must be aware of uh, when you're trying to use Sage. It doesn't actually answer every possible question. You still have to teach them how to solve these things. This is only in a single variable case, of course. But you can see here in the first case, it finds x equals 0, finds 0, and i, i, and then here it's everything. Um, and here's one that apparently somebody said that mathematically would solve. But again, it can't uh, find it. Although it gives this as a solution, but one is actually good. Okay, uh, Lagrange multipliers. Um, here we're going to start using the uh, uh, red uh, glasses, I guess, in a minute. Just to let you guys know if you um, uh, want to use this stuff, is you simply add a tag in the show command. And I kept on wondering how to get these things to work without having to click on the little menu. And it's not in the plot command. You can do it at showtime. And so um, that's it. I, I often turn spin on so it starts moving so they recognize it as three and you can see it happening. Essentially, what the show command is doing is it's tagging the things you put in there onto a script that's sent to the So it's just mechanical. Something I have been doing, if it's not in 3D, I used to turn the perspective depth off so it looks like it's going, you know, the, the, the lines really going off into the, in the distance. Uh, here I did it because I was just, this is an early one. Let's see if I can find John, it. John, I had no clue we could do this. So that, so we can pass any parameter, any any JML parameter in? I'm not sure that it's everything. I okay. haven't, I, I, just no, I just noticed last night when I was fixing command wow. line problems that there was, that there's a place where some extra stuff looks like it's tagged onto the end. I had no clue that you could do that. Set. So <laughs> I didn't know that that yeah. was stuck in there. Uh, I guess I say you like this. But just with a spin equals true, yeah, for example. Oh, you're ready. Uh, for the 
with range multipliers, I haven't figured out a nice way to make make it where the, where the user can just input the constrained equation and automatically go through and draw the curve. So I've made this one. I got a whole list of inter interesting functions here um, that I can pick from, and a whole bunch of different curves. Uh, I mean, a circle, constrained equations. But I still haven't figured out a way to, to make it where you can just enter G without having to enter, enter U and V. Because in, the, in their textbook, it's always entered as an equation. It's not entered in parametric form or any sort. So that's something I'm still trying to work on. So I'll, I'll have a bunch of these little selections here. And I'll have to activate uh, both the constraint equation and the uh, uh, parameterization of the uh, thing. Go to that and automatically figures out the, 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 uh, all the solutions of those uh, linear equations. And here's another nice one. So you can see. Let's see if I can. Oh, That's too much. <clears throat> about 150 percent. Yeah. Nonetheless, you can you can see the maxes right right there on that constraint equation, and of course you can see the max. And so it does actually find the merit. There it is. That's that's always a nice picture to have, I guess. Um, and so they can see it. And the important thing is you enter the functions at the top. The only thing the student has to do extra here is figure out how to parameterize the constraint curve. Uh, and that's it. So um, uh, a little more work for the kids to do. I would love to see Sage branded 3D glasses. <laughs> well, I'll, I will say this. That's like big those, silly. those cost about 55 cents a piece per hundred. They cost less if you get more. And if you buy a certain quantity of them, this is just from a website. And then they'll imprint whatever you want to on them. And there's, there, there's a screening fee, you know, some kind of setup fee of about 50, <coughs> 50 bucks or so. But if you did a zillion of them, then that would be minimized. Yeah, that's right. That's good. Just same, same brand. Oh, that's sneaky. Get your camera out there. Get your camera out there. All right. <laughs> yeah, you take a picture of William that. Self right. There you go. You have to push the button. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's high tech. You <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, you didn't use instructions. Uh oh. Um, it's a brilliant solution to the problem when you think outside the box. <laughs> Next order of business is the, uh, <laughs> Next order of business is doing integrate double uh, multiple integration, um, iterate integrals, and um, let's just find this problem like this. Standard issue, it's already set up, no no issues, and so I I start marching in and. Uh, Start integrating this thing, and I, there's my nice little function. I then integrate the function from there to there, and all of a sudden, what? And so this, by the way, just as an example, is a way for these new students not to be able to work problems where you have, if you want them to work problems by hand, <laughs> they construct problems like this so that they can't work them on stage yet. And so something that took me a while to figure out that I should have known immediately, but it wasn't in the Sage workshop, was, um, that's kind of big, sorry, is there's an assume command. You can just throw it in here, and now if I'm assuming that y is bigger than zero and less than two, then I go through and do exactly the same thing as before, and something useful shows up. Um, and then I can finish it off and get the answer. And working it the other way, um, by the way, there is a uh, forget command. Uh, it's very useful. Students use that too much on themselves, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> well, so you can start over. So on this sheet, I'm trying to go through and show how to work it the other way, and apparently the problem happens both ways because of the square root. So you go through and assume x is bigger than zero, and there's a clumpy door, and you get the same answer. So something very simple. That if you're teaching a class using Sage, you also get a problem you can't do, and you went, oh my goodness, what do I do? And the answer is, this could be something very simple with just type it in. But again, don't type it in until you want the kids to know that it exists. Otherwise, then they'll use it, and then you can't show those examples anymore. Um, all right. Uh, what I've been working on this week is getting this to work, because I, I was looking at this, and apparently Sage doesn't let you plot anything except from a fixed x to a fixed x and a fixed y to a fixed y over a rectangular domain. Unless you want to do something like you know, a special plot, cylindrical, spherical, and such. And so I wanted to do something like you have when you say you expose your trap by these curves down below, and it's a little piece of something. So um, let's see, there it is. 
I guess I'll have to redo this one again. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of a bit. So let's just click on it. This is the one that I thought would take a little while to do, and so I was so proud to have it all working earlier. Oh, little note while I'm waiting. I found this on the uh, Sage Wiki site somewhere, a uh, color picker. And you can just grab it, stick it in. It's really nothing, but they can go through and change the color of the resulting graphs. In particular on this one, I'm trying to shade in the volume in between. So it looks like a volume between two surfaces. And so um, I'm going to go ahead and click on stereographic here since you've got the glasses. We'll have to wait again and do it. Another issue I've had is if I click the update button, sometimes I have to click twice. Twice, almost all Oh, so that's not that's a that's a well-known button. I don't know, so I know it. I know it. Yes, I, I know it. It's irritating. It's you're sitting there waiting for something to happen. And you realize, oh, I didn't click twice. Go ahead and make it like that. There's also something else you can steal from here, which I stole from somewhere else, which is the ability to have a little slider here to uh, change the range of what you see. But you can see that this thing is. Uh, now you can almost, if, if I could add more, this is the only problem, I can't add infinitely many of these things because there's a bug. Once we get that fixed, then you'll be able to add a whole bunch of these things through there, and you'll actually, if you turn a bit, be able to actually see the volume for over any, any kind of region. Wow. One problem I'd like to add, well, one, one thing I'd like to add to this is right now I have to treat the constraints separately. I can't join them with an and, or an or. I'd like to have one box. Yes, sir? Yes, you can. Oh, I can! <laughs> Um, implicit plot 3D has a region option, and you can use and I believe you can use and in order to join those constraints. If well, not, I at least worked on a patch to do that a long time ago. I don't know if it ever got in. So, uh, so the constraints are something you can enter in plot 3D now, or, no, or it's it's just it's making them zero, making the function zero? I can, I, I can demo what I'm talking about later. So this is this is why I have the students students enter. And so I have right now two constraints, and if you don't want an extra constraint, I've made this kind of obtuse here. Um, I'm not sure what to enter to make something always true. I tried entering true. Maybe true in quotes would work better. I don't know what it's, yeah, it's expecting something else, that's all I don't know. But your standard issue problem for something like this is what y uh, is less than what? 3 minus x You're just squared. making sure that things only plot if they meet these constraints. Yes. The what, I, what I do is I go through and check, and, and if they don't meet the constraints, I set the function equal to another number. Right. Okay. And it doesn't plot it. Right. Um, so uh, there's, and I can change the top and the bottom. We'll just leave those alone. And um, But now I'm doing what would be more of like a standard kind of problem, where you just want to have it trapped. Well, I guess I should have pulled these over first. Move them. First octant or whatever between zero and three. Update, update. Oh, good. I didn't click update earlier. Okay. And this will be a more standard issue kind of textbook problem. I just wanted to show the other one because it was neater. Again, I'm running this off, off, off the web on the server somewhere else. So there's your standard issue kind of volume question. And you can change the top and the bottom if you want to. As long as you don't look at it right through there. And you're all golden. Yes, sir. Well, I guess we, Jason and I talked about this. JML do, is designed to render volume data yep. already. Yep. Um, so we have to pack. We have to figure out how to package it. Yep. See, I was thinking it would be something just trivial to go through and say, "Turn this on." And I, I thought about adding little little pencils around the edges. And, and Rob mentioned that the other day as well. <laughs> And it's just, it becomes too unwieldy. And you'll see in just a minute if I got to do it. I think John's solution is the best, is just to use the JML circuit or volume rendering features. I mean, they're not perfect. I, I sent you pictures of them. Yeah. yeah, but really all you're trying to render here is not actually the volume, yeah, but an ISO surface. Yeah. Right. And uh, and you could do that, too. We could set up a constraint factor. Here's the volume just data. Give you that, would right. just give you the ISO surface yeah, around that volume. Plus plot 3D would, yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, that we might be able to do it already because we may be able to construct the ISO surface and then do it this agent. So yeah. some sort of parametric plot we need. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You've got our wheels ticking, so good job. Yeah. <laughs> I, I keep on trying to do things. I'm, again, I'm, I'm more focused on this side right now, and it's just I want to do something, I try to figure out a way to do it. And I get frustrated sometimes. Uh, moving on to vector, uh, vector fields and such. Uh, I lost one here, but that's okay, I guess. Oh, well. 
looking at vector fields, and I, you know, this is this this is a built-in function. I have, I've done nothing here but just package it into interact. One thing I have done is you can go through and add extra vectors if you want to. So I would encourage you to use checkboxes. I don't know why this takes so because it's all time out, but you get the picture. And lots of vectors. And really way more vectors. And so you know, students can play with this yeah. until they get tired. Uh, this is very nice. Uh, these kind of these kind of uh, features. I also have three-dimensional version of this. This is the kind of things that if you go to a Sage booth or Sage presentation, this is what they always have showing. That's really sexy. And this is what the 3D glasses I think are the best for. Yes. I, I, they're the height of the yeah. So this is again just the same thing. I've got the 3D view of course on this. Yeah, right, and, and it's so hard to see the difference. Well, it's just quite good with it. You see a huge difference here, and it has to do with the mother line being really thin. Well, this doesn't really come out. It's kind of scary. I have had some students that are colorblind, and they never complain. They said they can see it. I don't know because the colors are so opposite. Oh, it's a. Well, the reason is because remember what the glasses do is just filter out different colors. Oh, it doesn't. As long as they are, they're, colorblind people are sensitive to the light. They just don't have enough different sensors. They can't tell the difference usually between red and green light. Yeah. Right. So it doesn't matter. It works for me. Oh well, there you go. There you go. Well, moving on real quick. But that's please. always a good thing to, to know about. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, I have a mistake here. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
see it have a running total of Yes, of yes, that's the idea. So actually, you know, probably the way to do that is not the way I just said. The way to do it is the way they do it in, in uh, algebra. And you can create a slider. Well, that, that, and, and have it have it follow the curve. That's, that's doable here because you can animate 2D plots. Right. And so if I could animate this plot, I could very easily just go and start the dot. I just haven't gotten that far yet. Right. I'm still a newbie. But I would pick the dot and run along, and, and then the total would be accumulating you somewhere. Get it bigger and right. bigger, and then smaller, and up and yes, down. Yes. You know, that, that's actually quite effective. I think. What we can't do at this point is we can't actually click on the plot and have it give right. input back to Sage. And this is what Michael was talking about. Right. This 80 pound. And the other thing, right? And the other thing that you'd want on that is like be able to click on the plot and have the, the for differential equations oh. have the have the integral curve that goes through that right. point, things like that. Oh, that'd be awesome. Wow. See, all of those things well, we can do possible. from the command line. Well, they're all done in other right. Right, in other situations. You just can't do it. Yeah. Oh, we need a different plot. Right? <laughs> no, awesome. sorry. Well, I mean that would work. That would do it, but. You just need communication that we're we'll selecting the dot and then we're telling the top state where the dot was. Cool. Right. 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 This is, of course, the way I really want to have that little dot moving along. Yeah. Right. That, that, and I want to have just the vectors that are along that curve. If I have just those vectors and just the dot, man, I'm having, I'm having an exciting concept. <laughs> I'm not sure it's going to work. This is, this is one place where I think we can use a lot of uh, a, a better JML interaction. So, for example, if you had a dot and you moved the slider, uh, we have to reload the entire JML yes. applet. So there's a flash, and then there's you know the time it takes to reload the JML applet. And over the web, the there's a long <laughs> flash. Right, but I mean JML can animate a dot going around. Well, I think, and, and I think exactly what like I that. think that that's probably the right way to do that. Just have you, do, you do the whole calculation, and you pass an animation to JML. And okay. then JML can have a slider that just goes that's through right. the frames you, of the animation. Yeah. That works. Can does does can JMall update parts of it? Like if you uh, have a JavaScript into JMall that will allow you to move one dot around, or does yes. it have to be kept everything? Right. You, yeah, you can send new information, tell it to turn stuff on and off, the add new add new data. The problem there is that the interact. I mean, when you do an interact, there's a, the output of the interact, and we don't know what the interact function is going to do. Maybe if you move a slider, the JMall disappears and some other thing comes up, etc. So. So in a sense, we have to reload the entire output of the interact for every change in the controls up here. Right, but you could, but you could build a different kind of control maybe you need jQuery or something like that that just talks yeah. to JMall and just move. Well, and that, you know, that's the that's new true. JMall interface for some of the, that's what it's doing. Well, Everything's on the be, web page. Uh, you could have the interior JMall interface with the right the the, 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 <laughs> the sliders and things like that. That's a little different. By the way, John, yeah, that's interesting. Interesting. So we can you have, have the tech uh, interact labels, but the thing at the bottom is exactly yeah. the actual output of the line. Yeah. You just want controls inside JMall. So J oh, no, I have I have three. Okay. Okay. You, you know you can do that. So yeah, basically, what you're talking about is you can do that. I tried to do the most but almost two. I came up with a JMall as the standard JMall, and then you'd have a JMall interact almost is what you're talking about. Well, it's a JMall plus plus button. Something like that that allow you to control certain kinds of things. Yeah. Right. And we can frame. send equations into JML, so we don't have to actually recalculate everything. If it's simple enough, it's very simple JML equations can JML can handle. But Most it's basic. Of these are really simple. I mean, sine, cosine, whatever. Yeah, it can ha basically can ha if you know what you'd expect to find in a, uh, no, uh, in, a in a standard programming environment right. is by way of standard functions that right. it pretty much has. So that would probably yeah. be fine for like. Through multivariable calculus easily. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Well, let me get the other stuff working. Yeah. <laughs> then we can talk Good. about that. Yeah. I mean, this would be an embedding that would work in a standard HTML frame. Right. You just put yep. on an HTML page, and JML would come up with a certain number of yeah. uh, buttons and so on to allow you to manipulate the image. So, anytime you want to yellow card the discussion and move on. Oh, I've done that. Okay.